All right, we're going to be in Amos chapter 4, so go ahead and open up there. I don't usually go verse by verse, but some of the material in here is going to lend itself to us spending quite a bit of time in the text. So if you would go ahead and open up there as I try to find it. Joel, Amos. All right, there we go. All right. No slides? Okay, well, I have my slides. All right, so Amos chapter 4. Um, to set the context here, Amos is prophesying to which part of, the, of God's people? North or south? Do you recall from last week? I know, it's been a long week. All right, so Amos is from the southern part, so Judah, the, the ones that are more faithful, but he's been sent to the northern uh, ten tribes to prophesy. Okay, so how would you describe the northern ten tribes? What are, what's their, their way of being? Faithful or unfaithful? Unfaithful. But it's not, it's not out and out rebellion like somebody who doesn't know God. It's this mixed worship. There are elements of godly worship. There are elements of, of idolatry all merged together into this kind of unique Israel religion that uh, is blasphemy to God, but they kind of feel good about it, as if they're honoring the traditions of, that's been, that have been passed down to them, but they're also kind of hip to the, the way that things are done all around them. So Amos is going to, into this area where he is not welcome, and he's proclaiming God's judgment upon them, okay? So with chapter 4, let's uh, read a little bit and begin our discussion. So chapter 4, verse 1, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, behold, the days are coming upon you, where they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks, and you shall go through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into Harmon, declares the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal, and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of, what is, of that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, so it's for you love to do, uh, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. Okay. So. How would you describe their worship from what Amos said in there? What, what are they doing? Well, what's work? Okay, let's even go back a step. What is what amounts to worship in the Old Testament under the law of Moses? How do you worship? Sacrifices. Sacrifices. Okay. What sort of sacrifices might one bring? Okay, so there are wave offerings. There are the one we always remember, the sin offering. When I've, when I've sinned, I bring uh, a, an offering to, uh, to appease or to atone for my sin. There are fellowship offerings. These are offerings that say, God, I'm, I'm coming and I'm bringing my, my family and friends and we're going to have a, have a party and we're going to invite you to the party. We're going to sacrifice a portion of the, of the, um, of the entree to you and we're going to have a party in your space and this is going to show that we're in fellowship with you there are free will offerings these are things that we bring in addition to what we owe because we're so grateful to be a part of your you know, your people god we're going to bring free a free will offering beyond what you've you've asked okay so these are just different ways that that an israelite could worship but look at what they're doing they're saying um Get over here. Come to Bethel and transgress to Gilgal and multiply your transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving uh, of that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings and publish them for so you love to do. All right, so he's saying basically keep on worshiping, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to accept what you're doing because it's not coming from your heart. It's not coming from, from pure motives. It's coming from this idea of we're going to go through the motions, but our hearts are far from, 
from uh, worshiping God because we're oppressing the poor, we're, uh, we're not supporting the needy, we're basically we're in it for ourselves, what we can get out of uh, our relationship with God. And since they're even, even profaning the offering, because in these uh, what, the uh, free will offerings, what were they including in the free will offering? They shouldn't. What's that? Okay, so yes, they were advertising. They're bringing a free will offering, and it's almost like when you see a, a politician giving a check. It's one of these big checks about this big. Look what I just gave to, to God. That's definitely not the spirit of how God wants to worship. What was never to be offered on, on the altar? Never, ever, ever would, would uh, profane the alt altar. What's that? A pig? Yeah. A pig would definitely do it, but that, that's not it here. It's leaven, yeast. Yeast represents corruption. In, in God's covenant, yeast represents corruption. And it says, go ahead, bring your leavened offering. So basically God's saying, I've, I'm so disgusted by you. Go ahead and do your worship. Uh, you're just piling on the sins that you've committed. You're just piling up the, um, the consequences for it. There's no, you know, there's no reason for me to even warn you again because you're just going to do your own thing. So go ahead and do the most disgusting thing you can do on my altar, which is to put leaven on it. Go ahead and do that too. Uh, you're, you're, so, uh, you're so profane in the way you're worshiping me. Okay, uh, let's read a little bit further. Uh, verse 6. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and a lack of bread in all your places, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain and one field uh, it did not rain. Uh, and the rain could wit and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees, the locusts devoured. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses. And I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. And yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. And he goes on. What's the pattern here? What, what was God doing? A series of disciplinary things. Right. And what was their response to the discipline? They ignored it. They, or they misinterpreted it. Or they just completely missed the point. So what is it to send to give someone cleanness of teeth? It means you gave them a visit to the dentist, right? No. In this culture, what, what would cleanness of teeth mean? No food. Your, your teeth aren't getting dirty because you've got nothing to eat. Okay. So God, it's interesting, he doesn't say, I punished you with it. He says, I gave it to you, almost as if this is a gift I'm giving you. I'm giving you this warning, this correction as a gift so that you don't go any further astray from me, yet you, you ignored it. You, you didn't recognize it. You didn't, you didn't heed it. And he goes on for several more, uh, several more sections here, telling them all the things he had done to try to correct them, to bring them back. Does God ever do that with us? If he loves us. Yeah, God loves us. He, he disciplines us because he loves us. Yeah, what happens if we uh, ignore that discipline? It gets, it gets stronger and stronger until, well, God eventually kind of just say, okay, go your way. That's where you don't want to be. That is the last place you want to be is where God has stopped trying to discipline you and has said, more like he's saying to them, go ahead, make your, your profane offerings. Go ahead, multiply your transgressions. Uh, I give up. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's where you don't want to be. <clears throat> okay, let's read a little further, starting with, uh, with verse yeah, with verse 1 of chapter 5. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise as the virgin Israel. Forsaken in her land, with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left. That which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, 
Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, and do not enter Gilgal or cross to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. All right, so we'll stop there and interpret a little bit. What's he saying about Israel? Right there in that first, first section. What's their status? Right. God's basically saying, as far as the nation of Israel, I'm done. I'm, I'm washing my hands of the nation of Israel, that uh, they will no longer be, uh, after this punishment comes, which is still a century or so away, but after this punishment comes, I will be done with Israel, these ten tribes, as a people. Does that mean he's done with every person in Israel? No, because it says how many would go out. It says a thousand would go out for battle and a hundred would return. So there's still this idea of a remnant that God's still going to save, God's still going to preserve, even out of this unfaithful group in the uh, northern ten tribes. Gideon. Correct. So God was, so there's the ten tribes in the north, the two, the two tribes in the south, Israel and Judah. God was giving up on the nation of Israel in the north. So they would no longer be his people as a, as a government, as a ge, uh, geopolitical entity. The people of Israel could still return to him, they could, as, as anybody in the world could, but he would no longer consider that nation to be chosen. Judah, on the other hand, in the south, would continue to be his favorite people because it's through Judah that the Messiah would come. So the southern ten tribes, uh, they would, the northern ten would be carried away to Assyria, and they would never come back. Uh, the, the people were, were just gone, dispersed among the nations. The southern two tribes would go to Babylon, but they would come back under Ezra and Nehemiah in that section of scripture. So a remnant of them would come back, resettle the land, and be, continue to be a people all the way down uh, until the time of Jesus and beyond. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Okay, um, forsaken, no more to rise. So God's saying, I'm, I am done with this nation. However, there's still a remnant that can come back. You'll go out a thousand, nine hundred are lost, but a hundred will be saved. Go out 100, 90 will be lost, 10 will be saved. Does that sound like anything Jesus talked about? Yeah, the gates. The, the way to destruction is what? Wide and straight. The way to salvation, narrow and, and steep. Okay, so you see Jesus is echoing things that were said even in, in the Old Testament. God, uh, God doesn't change. Okay, seek the Lord and live, in verse 6. Let us uh, break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it, de I'm sorry, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice into wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. Okay, so he's calling them to say, continue to, if you would seek justice, if you would seek, seek God, that he's still there to be found. Uh, because if you don't, then fire is going to break out. O oh, you who turn justice to wormwood. What is wormwood? It doesn't sound very appetizing. What they find in hell. Right. It, is, it's, it's, uh, it has a reference to hell. I think it's, it's, a, it's some sort of wood that would turn water bitter, turn, make water undrinkable. Um, so basically he's saying, you're turning my justice, which is which is right and wholesome and pure and you know, wholly good, you're making it bitter. So you, my people, who are supposed to be the agents of my justice, of my goodness, you're making it bitter. You're, ma you're not representing me to the nations, to, your, to those around you in the way that you should, and therefore you're perverting what, what ought to be. Do you see an application in Christianity for that? We're to be the, the salt of the earth, right? But if we're not salty, then we're useless. There's something God, God has a real problem when we, take, when we take his name 
and we profane it. When we're supposed to be his servants, we're supposed to be doing his will, yet we're serving ourselves, we're serving uh, our own interests, and not, and we're bringing a bad, you know, uh, casting a shadow across God's justice, across his glory. So something we, we never want to be found doing. All right. Um, verse 8, he who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns the deep darkness into morning and darkness, uh, the di- and darkness the day into night, who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash, flash forth against the strong, so the destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone. Okay, what, what's going on here? When they, are, uh, when they hate the one who reproves in the gate, what's that mean? What? Right. What, what's the, what happens at the gate of the city? That's where the elders sit. That's the seat of government. That's where, where stuff happens. It's the market. It's the government. It's, it's where all the, all the stuff happens of importance for the city, in, in a city uh, or for a nation. So when somebody is, is reproving at the gate, what are they doing? They're condemning practice? condemning something that's going on in the city, yet the people hate him, hate the person for doing it. And then what are they doing with the poor? They're basically taking, taking advantage of the poor. They're exploiting the poor. And, they're, and because of exploiting the poor, what are they able to do? <coughs> Build big houses. And what are the houses made out of? Hewn stone. So what does it mean to hew a stone? To chisel it. So we're not talking about just stacking up rocks and putting mortar between them in order to to build something that would provide shelter. This is dressed stone. This is sculpted to look really nice. Do you do that inexpensively? Anybody here live in a house made of hewn stone? No, we, we, we use brick. Or, or, or wood or siding because it's a lot cheaper. If you wanted to actually take and chisel out stone and stack it up, uh, that would be a very expensive proposition. Yet that's what the people were doing, not because they had planted and, and uh, received a great harvest and were able to, to create wealth. What was the source of their wealth? Exploiting the poor. Taking taxes from those who couldn't afford it. So if I if I exact a tax from somebody who can't afford it, who can't can't eat, what's that mean for that person? They're they're in, in servitude. They're you know, they can't they can't provide for their family. So God God hates vain worship, and God hates when we exploit the poor. That's two things that that God just will not will not permit to go unpunished. Okay. Um, Verse 12, for I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent at such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. So that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gates. It may, it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So he's telling them basically, the op- if you want to live, if you want to be part of the hundred that comes back out of the thousand, then you need to turn, turn everything that I've just said. Instead of exploiting the poor, you need to, to support the poor. Instead of hating those who, who teach righteousness, you need to love them and support them and seek, seek what they're teaching. And that's, that's how you'll live. Verse 16, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, uh, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, and in the streets there shall, they shall say, alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning, and the wailing of those who are skilled in lamentations, and in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. What's the last time the Lord passed through the midst of someone? Does that bring, bring a thought? 
at Passover. But what happened when God passed through their midst then? Yeah. Exactly. The, those who had the blood on the door, they were passed over. They were spared. Those who didn't have the blood, what happened? Death. For firstborn in all, the, all those houses died. Do you think the people hearing this from Amos understood what it meant for the Lord to pass through your company? Absolutely. And if they were, if they had any, if they had any goodness left in them, they would hear that and they would turn from it. But as we'll see, they, they didn't, they didn't turn. Okay, verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? What, what are they, what's he saying there? What, what's the point? Your worship is hypocritical. Okay, your worship is hypocritical. What are they calling for? They want the Lord to come, but they actually don't. Right, they're, they're in this, kind of, this cult, cultural religion that sort of acknowledges God but brings in all these pagan practices and puts it together into their own man-made religion. And even though they're worshiping that way, they would dare to call and say, Lord, come and, and, do, your, and do your thing. What does Amos tell them about that? Don't do it. That's like uh, uh, Mike White used to talk about, don't pray for patience. Because the only way to learn patience is God's going to bring, bring trouble. Here Amos is saying, don't ask, don't ask for the day of the Lord because it's not going to be good for you. It's going to be darkness and not light. It's going to be all this judgment that you said. Don't, don't think that this vain worship that you're doing has you in good standing with God. It doesn't. You're, you're in, in violation of his covenant and all those curses you've read about from Moses down they're going to come upon you in this day of the Lord okay so don't think that you can based upon your own righteousness upon your own way of acting that you can call on the Lord and that you can stand you won't stand it'll be darkness for you all right just a review the day of the Lord refers to what judgment, judgment. anytime God comes in judgment is the day of the Lord. It's not necessarily the, the final judgment. It's not necessarily the destruction of Jerusalem. It's many, many different times throughout God's dealing with man is the day of the Lord. Anytime he comes to, to set things right, to even the scales, is a day of the Lord. Okay, so, and if you're unrighteous in, in the day of the Lord, it's not good. If you are on the righteous side, then, then you'll, it's, it's better but still a very, very painful proposition. All right, I've been doing a lot of talking. Is this making sense? Any, any questions or comments? Gideon? Yes, the, when, when Jesus comes back to, to take the, the church home and judgment, that is the final day of the Lord. That's when everything is set right and justice is is done but if you if you assume that every time you read day of the lord throughout the prophets and even into the new testament that is talking about that you're going to get very confused because there are many different days of the lord correct that that is i believe that's in thessalonians I'm um, right, and I believe that is referring to final judgment. But I, I could be wrong with the Thessalonians reference, but yeah, it, it is referring to final judgment. Does that answer it? Right, so you got the parable of the virgins where he talks about you need to be prepared. Uh, you, he says he'll come as a thief in the night. Yes. Uh, it, it can mean that. It could also mean that he's come, that Christ is coming back to to conclude history and and um, and bring about judgment. 
So it could be either one, depending on which, uh, which age you're, you're alive in. And we don't know when that'll be, either our death or our, um, our uh, final judgment. All right, let me just make sure I haven't left anything out here. All right, let's jump into chapter 6. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the, fir- of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Calna and see, that, and from here go to Hamath the great, and go to Gath of the Philistines, Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs of the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and, like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls, who anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. All right. He's painting a picture here. Who's he talking to? People of Israel who are living in absolute comfort. Right. He's saying, those of you who, remember, he's, this is in the context, he's those who have made themselves rich by exploiting the poor. He's called them cows of Bashan, which is a very graphic representation. And now he's, he's really hitting it, hitting it home. Steve? Well, he's also talking to those in Israel as well, because he's talking about Zion. Right. He's talking about Jerusalem. So it's yeah. not only, you know, let's, you know, just so the people of, of Judah that are you know, doing the same thing don't feel like they can point their fingers or see what the prophet said. <laughs> right. But they're but they're headed there, they're they're headed there. Okay, so he get, he gets very graphic. He you know he's stepping on toes here. He's talking about their beds. Their beds are made of what? Ivory. Okay, there's few things more precious in the world than than ivory. It's it's always had had great value. It's a sign of wealth. And their bed is made of ivory. They're stretched out on couches. They're drinking. What are they drinking? By the bowl, so not not a goblet of of wine, but a but a bowl. You get the idea of it's this, it's the idle rich, those that just sit around consuming, 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 and having having no regard for what. What are they in so doing? What are they ignoring? Ignoring God, right? They're they're um, they, they have no no place for God in their lives. The only place they make for God is if God supports them in their in this lifestyle, if it uh, pushes up their their social standing because they're seen as being somehow in tune with God, they have place for that. But they don't have place for God as a one who would require of them, require that they uh, humble themselves, that they serve his purposes. They're, they have no no place for that. They sing idle songs on the harp, they drink wine by the bowls, but they're not grieved by the ruin of Joseph. Okay. If we were to put this into 21st century America, it's not, it's not a bed of ivory. It's a memory foam mattress. It's a $4,000 mattress, whatever the, the top end mattress. It's not bowls of wine. It's, you know, what was it? The, the Nebuchadnezzar, the, the big, the big bottle of wine. It's the decadence, all the while ignoring the fact that the nation is, is it's rotten. It's it's uh, become bitter to its core. That's that's what he's he's condemning. He's not necessarily condemning them because they have a bed of ivory. He's condemning them because that's become the pillar of their their success. This is what this is what matters to them, and not not the fact that God's nation is ruined. That that the poor are being exploited. Okay, do you see? Do you see the parallel? I'm not not necessarily representing it very well. Okay, 
Where does judgment begin? Where does judgment always begin with God? It always begins with the household of God, and that's true here as well. It's those that are claiming God, that are calling for the day of the Lord, that are saying, we're right, God, we need you to come and set things straight. They're the ones where judgment begins. And in this case, they're found guilty. When, when the Lord comes, he says, you are, your worship is profane, your, your motives are profane, your, even your houses are profane before me. I have nothing for you but punishment. Verse 8, the Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the pride of Jacob and I hate his strongholds and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. If ten men remain in one house, they shall die. When one's relative, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up and bring the bones out of the house, and they shall say to him in, who is in the innermost parts of the house, is there still anyone with you? He shall say no. And he shall say silence. We must not even mention the name of the Lord. So you see how it's changed. After judgment comes, it, before judgment it was, bring on the day of the Lord. We, we're we're going to be justified. After the judgment, we're not even going to, dare to whisper his name. We're, we're so humbled, we're so, we're so uh, taken from our, our pedestal that we, we don't want the day of the Lord anymore. Verse 11, uh, for behold, the Lord commands and the great house shall be struck down into fragments and the little house into bits. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But they have turned <laughs> justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. And who rejoices in Lodibar? who say, we ha have we not by our own strength captured Carnaim for ourselves? Be for behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall oppress you from Labo Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. So God's saying, it's coming from, this, those are basically the markers of the territory of, of Israel. Uh, from, from here to here, you're going to be overthrown. I'm going to take you out, and there's no, there's no recovering from it. All right. Those are the, uh, the thoughts from the text. Any comments before I turn it over to Greg for some New Testament application? All right. It's all yours, Greg. Thank you. Since we don't have any slides, if you'll turn uh, to Luke 18, uh, 9 through 14, we'll start there. Um, we're going to go through the Pharisee and the tax collector and how it kind of re uh, reflects back to chapter 6 there, and then also the parable of the rich fool, which will be uh, Luke 12, 13 through 21. So let me first start um, with Luke 18, and as I'm reading this, just think of the things that we just heard from Tom of how that relates back to, to what Amos uh, was saying. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, Thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a day. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exhausted. So the question is, what is God telling us here when we kind of look what we just learned through chapters 4 and 6? How can we relate that back? Any thoughts? He sees everything. And I, one thing I had is, yeah, God accepts the sinner who humbles himself but utterly rejects the self-righteous. Uh, and then second, it kind of, the tax collector exhibits um, what, we, what we heard on Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, for me, it's, it's the don't be judgmental, as we said, and hypocritical, I think you mentioned, is what I kind of got out of it. And then if you read James 4, uh, verse 6, but he gives more grace, therefore it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Um, so not, not basically coming from the heart. That's what I got. Anything else on that?
Yes, I, yes, I believe that. And if, you, if we look at the, the next parable to it, it's, for me it is a little bit of a struggle to always think, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be a, I want to be a humble person, but I don't want to be boastful or brag, especially, you know, outside of church. Um, and it's, and when you look at that, you think of the tax collector who's probably poor and, uh, and sitting back and, and not necessarily being, you know, upfront and, 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 and trying to make, uh, himself look, I guess, more important. And it's just, those are the things that I, you know, you, we got to be humble to make sure that we, we're doing the right things. So, um, let me, let me jump to Luke 12. Let's see, make sure we're not out of time. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man who made, made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of the rich man produced plentiful. And he thought, and he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my, and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and things you have prepared. Whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and not rich toward God. So this is, again, going back to chapter 6 of the ivory um, and, and those types of things is, is basically God is warning us that possessions or wealth on earth is, is, not, is not what we're here for. Um, if we ignore him, um, if we honor him, he's going to bless us. And I kind of my final thought, again, is if we ignore discipline. So you mentioned you know, God's discipline and discipline and the southern tribes, you know, they his mentioned being their favorites because they continue to, to return back to him. Um, so any thoughts, any more thoughts on that particular parable? Good point. Any further thoughts for we? So the tax collector, he, he was still a tax collector. So uh, he was a forgiven tax collector. So many people could have occupations that could get them at odds with the word of God. But what we learn from Zacchaeus is as a tax collector, he said, I'll make right all the things that I did wrong. And I think uh, uh, that type of a tax collector would not uh, extort uh, from that point on uh, going forward. He might still struggle with it, but he, he will live a, confess, a confessing type of a lifestyle. Yeah, okay. I think that's the same as what Gideon's saying about being humble. Yeah. Anything else? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given to us and ask that you help us clear our minds and that we learned uh, from Amos and the New Testament today and help us apply it to our lives and ask that we see and, and hear your disciplines upon us and help us make the changes when, when we see those and not ignore them. I ask that you watch over us the rest of the day and uh, throughout the sermon today and just bless us and watch over those that aren't here with us today. In Christ's name, amen.